A reading from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Peter, Peter began to speak to the Gentiles. I believe that's us. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does, and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Uh, on this day, we have uh, two readings. Uh, the second one is from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received. But Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, although some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint the body of Jesus. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised and is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So the women, women went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of Christ. It is good to have arrived at Easter Sunday to come to the morning of this day where we celebrate what we heard about in the Gospel of Mark. That when the women went to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus, they found that the tomb was empty, that he was not there. 
There was a young man dressed in white, which any of Mark's readers would have interpreted quite readily as an angel, saying, yeah, he's not here. He is arisen, and you can see him in Galilee. He said he was going to go there and meet you there. Tell the disciples, and you can go see him. This proclamation is something that is absolutely amazing and remarkable and unexpected, something that people didn't see coming. And that's part of the reason why the women were both amazed and frightened at the same time, so much so that the gospel ends with them going away, not telling anybody anything because of their fear. Yeah, that's how the gospel of Mark ends. The journey we began back in Christmas comes to a rather abrupt end just like that. And it probably makes you wonder, why exactly? That's kind of odd. That's a little sharp. Why would the gospel end like that? Well, that's a very good question. It's worth exploring. Because many of you will know, wait a minute, I'm pretty sure there are some other verses in the last chapter of Mark, and you just stopped early, didn't you? Well, I'm glad you're wondering about that question, because it is a very good question to explore. The Gospel of Mark, as we have talked about already, is the first of the Gospels in the Bible that was written. And as we have been exploring it ever since Christmas, we have been working hard to maintain the discipline of letting the Gospel of Mark speak for itself. In other words, we've been trying not to let what Matthew and Luke and John say, which were written later, we're trying not to let what they say fill in any gaps in Mark, because Mark was written first. And in fact, Matthew and Luke used Mark as the foundation for their own Gospels. And so we're taking the Gospel of Mark on its own, as it is, and running with it. And so when it comes to this ending, why does it stop at verse 8? Especially if you're pretty sure there were other verses that come afterwards. Well, we do not have the original manuscripts of any of the books of the Bible. We only have copies. And so the copies that we come across that are older are the ones that are most likely to be most like the original. And the oldest copies of the Gospel of Mark that we have stop at verse 8. The Gospel ends like you heard Margaret read it this morning. Now, some of these discoveries showed up a little bit later in our history, and so this is why you will see other words added in some of our Bibles. But let me explain how this is happening and to explore why it's important for us to recognize this. There are actually four ways the Gospel of Mark ends, depending on which manuscript you end up finding. And so I've already said this is the original. We're going to come back to it in a sec. But the first kind of ending that the Gospel of Mark has adds a couple of sentences to verse 8. It kind of like adds a verse 9. And this version sounds like this. After we read verse 8, they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. It goes on to say, and all that had been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterwards, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Well, that sounds better, doesn't it? Those couple of sentences kind of, you know, make it that they didn't say anything to anybody because obviously the women ultimately said something. Otherwise, there'd be nothing to write, you know. Um, And so here it acknowledges that they went ahead and talked to Peter and the others. And then we have that final sentence that puts a lovely bow on it and finishes up nice in this wonderful package. The problem is, even if you don't know the Greek that it was originally written in, even the English translation is clearly nothing like how Mark has been talking the entire time that we've been going through his gospel. The language of that last sentence is completely different from any way that Mark writes. The sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. I mean, it's a lovely sentence, but that's just not how Mark talks. In fact, the word salvation doesn't appear in the gospel of Mark at all. The word save and saved appears eight times, but salvation as a thing, as a category, that's just not in Mark's vocabulary at all. So what has happened here is somebody has evidently felt that 
ending it at verse 8 seemed a little bit too abrupt. So they added a couple of sentences just to tighten it up a bit and make it a little bit more complete in its presentation. So that's another version of the end of the Gospel of Mark. Now, the next one we want to explore is the one that we are probably more familiar with. In fact, any of us who have ever owned a King James Version of the Bible, if you read the Gospel of Mark, you will see verses 9 to 20 in this chapter as well. There's, it seems, a lot of this chapter that we left out. In fact, even in the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, which we use every Sunday, you will see verses 9 to 20 in there. They're just separated by parentheses or brackets. And in some versions, you'll see it as a footnote instead. But these verses are the ones that uh, we're more familiar with. And depending on what your church tradition is, you might actually like some of the stuff that's in verses 9 to 20, and you'd kind of hate the idea of giving it up. In my Pentecostal background, we liked that part because it talks about speaking in tongues, and we didn't want to give that up to think it wasn't originally part of the Gospel of Mark. But as we go through these verses, we're going to find something rather fascinating. After verse 8, where it says that the women went out and fled from the tomb and didn't say anything to anyone because they were afraid, now it continues and says, Now after he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. Mark has talked about Mary Magdalene already, but he hasn't said anything about her deliverance from seven demons. Um, That's actually from the Gospel of Luke. And so that's why that's there. She went out and told those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping, but when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. You find that in the Gospel of Luke as well, that when the women have visited the tomb and go tell the disciples, they just don't believe what they're saying. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking in the country. Sound familiar? The road to Emmaus, which is from the Gospel of Luke. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Well, that's interesting because in the Gospel of Luke, they shared their story together with the two people walking to Emmaus when they hooked up with the other disciples. So that's a curious thing. Later, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were sitting at the table, and he upbraided them for their lack of faith and stubbornness because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. Well, that's from the Gospel of John, but actually not even quite exactly. Because to say that Jesus was upbraiding them because they were not showing any faith to believe what had been said is an overstatement to what we read in John. In John, it's really about Thomas. Jesus had appeared to the ten disciples a week earlier, and then when they're telling him that we've seen the risen Lord, he's saying, look, I'm not going to believe it until I get to see him just like you guys did. And until I can touch him and actually greet him just like you guys did, I'm not going to believe. So then Jesus appears when Thomas is there, and he says to Thomas, hey, look, stop doubting and believe. But it is by no means upbraiding. So that's curious. It goes on to say, and he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. Well, that's the Great Commission from the Gospel of Matthew. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. That's from the Gospel of John. And these signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes in their hands. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. And you see all of that in the book of Acts, which was written by the guy who wrote the Gospel of Luke. With one exception, nowhere in the Bible will you find any reference of somebody drinking some deadly poison and it not harming them. It's just not there. So why it's in this list, I don't know, but everything else you will definitely see in the book of Acts. So then the Lord Jesus, by the way, Mark never says Lord Jesus. He just doesn't. Anyway, but so then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. That's the ascension from the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And they went out and proclaimed the good news everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the signs that accompanied it. And that's the book of Acts. 
So what has happened here with this longer ending that has for the longest time been the tradition in the church as the way that the book of Mark actually, or the gospel of Mark actually ends, is actually drawn from these gospels that were written later and written back into the gospel of Mark. Mark was written around 65 CE, we've been working with, about 35 years after the time of Jesus. But the Gospels that were written after that have been used as a source to fill out the ending, to make it more acceptable. And when you're drawing from the Gospel of John, you're drawing from something that was written 30 years later than the Gospel of Mark. And so this idea of it ending on verse 8 just seems unacceptable, and the effort was made to read things back into it. Now, what's also curious about these additional pieces is you get the bit from Matthew and the bit from Luke and the bit from John being added there, and they don't all completely line up, which is interesting. Because, of course, as people are writing about Jesus decades after Jesus actually lived, they've had time to reflect and consider what does it mean that Jesus did this or said this, and they've come to different theological and doctrinal conclusions that are actually rather interesting and curious and even somewhat at odds with each other. So, for example, we've already acknowledged that Matthew, which is probably the next gospel to have been written after Mark, has the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. I mean, what a widespread, open, invitatory way of communicating what Jesus is all about. And it's a mission to go on to. But compare that to what the Gospel of John says. We acknowledge this part that was in this extended version the one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. Feels a little different, doesn't it? This comes right from John chapter 3. You know John three sixteen, the famous verse, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Well, verse 18 says, those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. That's a completely different feel from what Matthew is saying with his great commission. But because people didn't like how Mark ended his gospel, they're drawing from his other gospels and shoving them all together and failing to recognize that the thing that John is saying, the conclusions John has reached, is different from the conclusions that Matthew has reached. And there's no appreciation of the diversity of understanding that the early church had about the life of Jesus and what his death and resurrection meant. In fact, there's this fourth ending it takes this longer ending and it adds a few more sentences to it precisely for this reason. <laughs> because there is a challenge with the way things are written and it's like, well, we need, to, we need to deal with that. And so the extra sentences that are added in this fourth version come after that part about Jesus upbraiding them for their lack of faith. This goes on to say, after it says here, he upbraided them for their lack of faith and stubbornness because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. There's a manuscript that says, and they excused themselves, saying, this age of lawlessness and unbelief is under Satan, who does not allow the truth and power of God to prevail over the unclean things of the Spirit. Therefore, reveal your righteousness now, thus they said to Christ. And Christ replied to them, the term of years of Satan's power has been fulfilled, but other terrible things draw near. And for those who have sinned, I was handed over to death, that they may return to the truth and sin no more, that they may inherit the spiritual and imperishable glory of the righteousness that is in heaven. A couple things about that. Mark never refers to Jesus as Christ. Like, not just by that title alone. He talks about Jesus being the Messiah, being the Christ, but he never refers to Jesus as Christ. But here in these sentences, that's what whoever authored them had said. 
But you know, everything in that little edition, the reference to Satan and the demons and, and all this stuff, that's all from the book of Revelation. That's all the imagery you see in that final book in the scriptures. And so that was also written in the late 90s, perhaps a little bit earlier. It's always hard to tell exactly when these things are written. But here we have the book of Revelation being added to the ending of Mark, something that was written 30, 35 years after the gospel of Mark was written. All of these different endings to the gospel are because there was a dissatisfaction with the fact that it ended at verse 8. And the thought was, let's add to this and make the story better. But that's not how the earliest manuscripts of Mark ends. They end that short way that you heard Margaret read. Now, why does it end so abruptly? There are two basic theories as to why that might be. One theory is that the last page of the original manuscript was lost, that the original author did actually intend to have more stuff after that, but somehow the papyrus got damaged or something, and, and so the copies that were being made didn't include that last page or last paragraph or whatever. It's possible. Sure, there's no way to prove it. But I would suggest to you that the other reason is the better one. It ends at verse 8 because that's when the author of the Gospel of Mark intended to end it. Now again, it's obvious that the women eventually told somebody, right? And the fact that Mark is writing his Gospel 35 years after the time of Jesus, obviously he's going to be aware that stuff was going on and things were happening and Paul was preaching and the church was growing and the proclamation of the gospel was already being out there. So it's not like Mark just didn't know that nothing else happened. He deliberately ended it in verse 8. So the question is, well, why? Why would he end it like that? Well, we've already seen with the attempts made by various other authors to take from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts, and Revelation, and try to fill out the ending, there are some conflicting concepts, a couple things that you don't find any elsewhere, anywhere else in the Bible. You've got these different ideas of how it ought to have gone. What's the right story? What actually is the upshot of all of this? By not including an ending beyond that, beyond verse 8, Mark leaves it up to the reader to write the rest of the story. Mark leaves it up to the person who has been reading the previous 15 chapters of the gospel, reading about Jesus, reading about his message, what it is that he said, what it is that he did, what it is that he demonstrated, what it is that he was all about, what he was calling people to, what he experienced, what he endured, how he died. And now you get to this last chapter and you only need eight verses to get the point across that, hey, the tomb is empty. He's not there. He's going to meet everybody in Galilee. That's all you need to know that the story didn't end. Because, of course, that's what everybody was thinking about after the crucifixion on Good Friday. They're thinking, we thought he would be the Messiah, but he's dead now. That, that's not going to work. Now he's just like one of those other dozen guys or so that had shown up and claimed to be the Messiah before him, and they either died or were put to death, or they just fizzled out, and they were obviously not the Messiah. Now he's just like one of them. We thought there was something to go with here. But with these eight verses, Mark tells us all we need to know to realize, wait a minute, the story's different. Because if the tomb is empty, if he has been raised, then everything he said and did and demonstrated and talked about now has a life of its own that continues. It's not over. His words have not passed away. And so now, as the reader, how am I going to incorporate these living words of Jesus into my life now? 
How am I going to finish the chapter as it were? Here we are 2,000 years after these events. How are we going to see the reality of the risen Christ alive in my life, in this context, in this place, at this time, right now? We get to write that. We get to take what it is that Jesus had shown us and revealed to us and see how it's meant to affect and move us in our lives, in our actions, in our words, and everything that we are. So it is good and brilliant that the Gospel of Mark ends at verse 8 of chapter 16. The question is now, what are you going to do with the Gospel that we've just spent a few months exploring? Amen.